Hey everyone, Eric here. In this video, we are going to walk through comparables analysis, aka the multiples valuation method. By the end of this video, you will understand how to use this valuation method for yourself. First, we're going to walk through some context, and then we are going to look at a case study. Okay, let's get started. Okay, let's zoom in a little bit. So, the comparables analysis valuation method is based on the idea that one business's valuation should be comparable to other similar businesses. But that being said, if the overall market is really hot, well, all similar businesses are going to be valued at higher multiples. And the opposite is true as well. So if the market is not doing well, all similar businesses will be getting worse multiples. So this has nothing to do with understanding the market as much as looking at businesses and making sure that one business fits within the group or realm of reasonableness to other businesses that have similar performance. So that assumes that you have a business that you can compare your business to. Sometimes there's outlier businesses that are basically not comparable to, to any other businesses. So the math of this method is just to look at multiples of valuation divided by different financial metrics. So the classic multiples valuation method is price to earnings. So you take the valuation divided by the total earnings and you get a ratio. So let's say it's 25 PE ratio or price to sales. That being said, there are a lot of different types of multiples and the context of the multiple is really the thing that matters. It's not the actual multiple. So I'm gonna walk through all these different situations where multiples would be very, very, very different. And so I just want you to kind of understand that this stuff does not exist in a vacuum. Okay, so first let's talk about venture capital versus private equity. So from a very high level, Venture capital is a game of trying to be in these moonshot companies. Private equity is a game of financial engineering and being in companies that generally don't grow much. So in venture capital, there's thousands and thousands of startups that are funded every year. And around 20 of them produce 97% of all the returns for that cohort of businesses. So it's all a game of trying to be in one of those companies where you make 1,000 or 10,000 extra money. So for instance, really early businesses in venture capital, a lot of times don't even have revenue, don't even have users. So they're just forming a hypothesis about the founders, about the idea, and they're just putting money into it. So there's no sort of comparables method, but as the business scales up, and maybe it's series B, series C, series D, series E, and it's generating revenue, now you can start to use these multiples methods as the business gets de-risked towards its ultimate goal of being a very large company. So that's the kind of venture capital investment strategy, whereas private equity generally tries to buy businesses that have low risk, a lot of times they're not growing, and they have very high cash flow. And that's more of a financial engineering game where they try to buy them with a huge amount of debt so that the businesses then later pay off the debt. And even if the fund resells the business at the same price they bought it at, well, the business, they did it with a bunch of debt. So the sort of equity, if they only put in one third equity and two thirds debt, if they sell the business later and doesn't have any debt, they can make triple their money even if the valuation doesn't go up. So private equity is gonna be very rigid with the multiples and they're gonna be focused on profit multiples. Whereas VC probably are gonna be focused on top line multiples because they're interested in growth. So yeah, so if you think about this, you know, early stage, if there is a multiple, it's gonna be super high. Growth stage, higher, you know, not higher than early stage, but higher than a mature company. And then mature businesses are going to have lower multiples because they have less future upside. So the more future upside, the higher the multiple. Okay, so public versus private. One interesting thing that is just true is that investors will pay a premium for liquidity. So if you own a private business, you can't get your money out. But if that same business goes public the next day, you can buy 10 shares, you can sell 10 shares in the same second. And having that ability to, for that optionality of your liquidity, people will pay a lot more for the same earnings just to know that they're liquid. So that's a big, um, investors that sort of focus on this are like these crossover investors that want to get in businesses like when they're still private before they go public because they think there's going to be this liquidity premium. Then you have um, various valuation methods. You have the discounted cash flow method, but the comparables, method is, is ultimately the dominant method that most of these companies are going to make more sense under this framework. Um, public markets. So none of this is like a video on how to invest. I'm just trying to give you context on how this world works. 
So within public markets, this could help someone to have their own point of view on the valuation of a company. And so let's say a, a company is trading for 20 billion, you do your analysis with this method, and you think the company is worth 30 billion. So the idea would be you buy that company, and your hypothesis is that the market eventually will agree with you. Well, maybe it won't, maybe it will, but it gives you a framework to try to understand the price. Private markets, it can be the same thing. You're trying to say, hey, does the value of this business in this fundraising round make sense? Or maybe you're just trying to assign a value to a business. Maybe you're, you're in venture capital and you're going to lead the round, and so you need to set the pricing. So um, the last point is that, yeah, I've talked about it a lot, but growth investors are trying to buy something that they think is going to be super valuable in the future, and a lot of times they're willing to pay a very high price for something that they think is going to be worth a lot more in the future. Value investors are trying to buy something that they think is worth more today than it's being priced at. So they're trying to arbitrage um, from the tr in the traditional definition of value investing. They say, oh, this business, you know, its price has been beaten down by the market. I think it's worth more. So they buy it, hoping that the price comes up today. Growth investors are hoping that the price goes way higher in the future. So it's a pretty different type of analysis. So let's look at a quick case study. So here we go. We are going to talk about marketplace businesses, which are one of the dominant types of tech businesses. And most of the big tech companies have a marketplace component. So Facebook and Google, what's behind those businesses are advertising marketplaces. Uber is a rideshare marketplace. Amazon is a marketplace for e-commerce, at least it's e-commerce business. So from one side or another, a lot of the dominant businesses right now are marketplace businesses mixed with sort of SaaS businesses. So let's say there's a new marketplace planning to IPO at 4.1 billion, and we're trying to understand if that valuation makes sense relative to other companies, so if it's comparable. So let's take a look at how you would even assign a valuation yourself and then compare that to the 4.1 billion. So let's say you have company A. Company A is public, you can see its financials, and its market cap is 26 billion. And so these numbers are all in millions, so if this is 26, it's 26 billion. And so we'll put these market caps with a color. And so first off, let's say that it's gross merchandise value, and that's called GMV, and with marketplaces, that's what the consumer side of the marketplace is spending. But marketplaces themselves usually take a cut of what the consumers spend. So a lot of times they'll have consumers, say, spending $13 billion, but the marketplace takes a cut of that. And in this situation, the revenue would be an 18% cut of what the consumers are spending. So on Airbnb, you'll see there's all these different fees. The, the GMV would be what's moving through the Airbnb marketplace, and Airbnb's revenue would be um, what their cut of the, effectively the, the total money spent is. So that's how a marketplace generally is reported. Sometimes the GMV can also be reported as revenue, but then the payments to your sellers go out through the cost of sales. So in Amazon, you'd see that their revenue actually is the GMV, but the vast majority of their revenue then goes back out to their sellers. So you just want to understand if your GMV is broken out or if your GMV is in the revenue. So in this marketplace, GMV is 13 billion, revenue is 2.3. Annual revenue growth is 76% in the current year. Gross margin is 1.9 billion. The lifetime value to CAC ratio, so the lifetime value is the lifetime gross profit that you make on your relationship with one customer. So someone might buy with you for the first time, but if you study how many times they buy with your company, we're seeing basically that the average number of times that they buy is basically a, a series of purchases. And the gross profit that we make from that is a certain number, right, of lifetime gross profit. And we spent a certain amount of marketing to get them to make that first order. But after they made the first order, we no longer had to spend any more marketing because now they're a loyal customer. So we're saying that we make off them 2.6 times in profit what it took us to spend in marketing. So let's say one customer, we make $260 of lifetime profit. It costs us $100 
That's the customer acquisition cost to get them to buy for the first time in marketing. So our CAC to LTV ratio is 2.6. So this just tells you, you know, how effective are your marketing investments and what's the ROI from a profit standpoint, and it's basically 2.6x. So let's say this business, you know, it's a lot more mature, it's big, you know, big, bigger gross merchandise value, and it actually has positive operating income, has positive net income, and it has EBITDA of 464. So if its valuation is 26 billion, what you do is you just compare all these metrics to its valuation. So 26 divided by 13 is the multiple of valuation to GMV. So it's valued two times GMV. In this case, it's valued 11.1 times revenue. It's valued 13.5 times gross margin. It's valued 48 times operating profit, 64 times net income, and 40 times EBITDA. So we have this one business now, and we have these um, multiples. And this is what we're going to use to compare across companies. So let's say then we have company B. Company B is uh, another business that's public. And of course, you could include a private company in this, no problem, if you had the data and the sort of valuation of its most recent fundraising round and all the financials. But let's say we're studying public companies in this scenario. And company B is valued at 19.6 billion. Its GMV is 2.9. So let's see. It's, it's basically trading at 6.8 times its gross merchandise value. Well, that's a lot more than company A. It's trading at 24 times its own revenue, 28, 28.6 times its gross margin, and then it's still unprofitable. So what would be going on in this situation? Well, first off, its revenue is growing 264% a year. And its LTV to CAC ratio is 5.6 times. So when they put in $1 of marketing, they make back $5.6 of profit. Maybe not right away, but for basically that's the cash in, cash out on their sort of lifetime value. So these metrics are way better than company A. It's, you know, it's tripling in a year. And when they acquire a customer, that customer spends way, way more relative to that marketing investment. So with a company that's metrics are significantly better, people are going to pay a lot higher price to own it. The market is going to value that company way higher because this company maybe, you know, maybe it's doing 8, 12 in revenue this year, but if it's tripling in a year, well, now its revenue is actually higher than this company. So if this company is going to have higher revenue than company A a year from now, well, maybe the valuation should be even higher. Maybe it should be 30 billion or 40 billion because if it's the same as company A a year from now, but it's growing at a way faster rate and its core profitability is better, then investors might say, okay, this company deserves an even higher valuation. So you want to dig into sort of when you see these high multiples, uh, why? You know, is the customer retention really, really good? What is so spectacular about this one company versus the other? How fast is the revenue growing? And in some situations, these multiples, actually, this might be a more interesting company to invest in than this one. So this is sort of that mindset around growth, growth versus value, although you actually might be getting a better value with this company in the long term. So company C, let's say we have its financials. It's, a, it's about to IPO. They released its financials, and or maybe it just IPO'd. So let's just say just IPO'd. And it released its financials, and it's 860 GMV, 189 revenue. It's growing at 310% a year. Its LTV to CAC is 4.1. And yeah, its gross margin is 149. So, okay. So what do we do here? Let's look at some of these other businesses. Okay, so uh, these businesses, this business is growing a lot slower, and it has a worse LTV to CAC, and it's being valued at two times GMV. This business is growing still slower, but it has a better LTV to CAC. So what might make sense as a multiple? Well, you can kind of look across these two companies and say, look, I think our company is competitive, but because its LTV to CAC is slightly worse, the market should be valuing it at five times. 
this company gets a higher valuation because its LTV to CAC is, is better and it's further along, although it's growing faster. Or not faster, but really fast. Revenue, you would look across these two and maybe say, okay, maybe, maybe it doesn't deserve the valuation of company B, but maybe we still think it's you know worth 18 times revenue. So revenue growth. Well, revenue growth is growing quite fast. So, you know, in that situation, maybe let's say it's 20 times. Um, gross margin. This trades at 13.5 times its gross margin. This is 29 times its gross margin. Well, maybe this one could trade at 24 times its gross margin. And these other multiples, you can't use multiples of valuation to losses. That doesn't really make sense. So, and these businesses are losing money because they would be investing so much money in marketing to acquire new customers, but then they would be profitable on those customers later and turn profits later. So they're basically investing as fast as they can to optimize the future growth of the business. So in this situation, all you would do now that you came up with some, you compared, it's called the comparables valuation method, now we compared, and you just multiply the revenue by our guesstimates. So we're saying that in these situations, okay, we think our business is worth, let's say, 4.3 billion. And remember, it's going, it's just gone IPO'd and its valuation is currently 4.1 billion. So we're like, okay, on a GMV basis, we think it's worth 4.3. On a revenue basis, we think it's worth 3.8. And on a gross margin basis, we think it's worth 3.6. And so you'd want to look across all these methods and just say, like, what do I think, you know? A fair valuation for this business is, and maybe you'd average them, or maybe you'd say, hey, revenue is the best predictor. And so in this situation, if this ultimately was your real analysis and you have really understood this business, you might say, hey, you know, 4.1 billion is a is a fair price. And I think that that, you know, if I buy that, that holds up relative to similar companies in the market. Um, and that's a reasonable valuation that makes sense. And so one thing I want to say is that the hotter the market is, the more the pricing moves into the future. So the exits have gotten bigger and bigger for tech businesses over time. It used to be the big exit was $1 billion, now it's $100 billion because these businesses are able to grow and generate revenue in a very dramatic way now because of the network effects of the internet. And so the hotter the market and the bigger the exits, the bigger everything gets. So the higher the valuations go. So in hot markets, a lot of times they'll say, okay, company C, you know, its revenue is 860, but it's growing at 310. So we're going to use one year forward revenue. So we're going to multiply that by three, and then that would be 2.5 billion. And so in that situation, you would, you would take your, your, your valuation and say, okay, well, you know, I think next year it's going to be worth 12.9 billion. And you might do the same for everything. You might say, okay, this is going to be multiplied by three. So I think it's going to be worth um, 11.3. This and maybe um, 1. 1.149 is going to be multiplied by three. And so you might say, okay, I think it's going to be worth, you know, 10.7. And so the hotter the market gets, a lot of times investors will get more generous and start valuing companies off their future projections. And so um, in worse markets, they're going to be, you know, using more revenue, gross margin, profit, current year, or even trailing 12 months. And the hotter the market gets, a lot of times the more the financials they use are actually in the future. All right, so that's it for today for the comparables analysis method. Okay, so I hope this gives you some really good perspective on how to use the multiples valuation method. Also, a special announcement. Make sure you are on my email list. There's a link to get on it in the description below. I'm launching a Finance for Startups course in November where I'm going to take a small group of students and walk them through everything I know about the startups ecosystem. So if you're interested in getting involved, make sure you're on my email list so you don't miss any updates. Also, like always, you can download this Excel file for free in the description below. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel. Only 10% of viewers subscribe to my channel and it really helps. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in the next video.